here that if as x approaches some fixed domain value, call it A, the y values, the corresponding domain range values, are approaching some fixed y value, then we abbreviate this with this notation. The limit as x approaches A of f of x is equal to L. And we looked at one example last time. Okay, we're going to do a whole bunch more now. So let's, um, rather than building a table like we did on the last page here, we're just going to guess by looking at the graph. Okay. So, and I want to highlight here the difference between evaluating the function at a point and finding the limit. Okay. So I'm on page two of those notes. Everyone, everyone okay with that? Okay. So if I were to ask you to evaluate this function at x equals four, what would it spit out? Yeah, uh, negative three, good. Negative three in this case. Okay. Now, how do we find the limit? Well, the way we think about taking the limit is we're going to approach the x value four from either direction and see if, there, if it's approaching some fixed range value, which it may not always do. Okay, we'll see some examples where the limit doesn't exist. But if I were to approach the value x equals four from the left, you know, I'd be plugging in points like this one here, then this one here, then this one here. And as I plug in values closer and closer to x equals four, I find that the y values are getting closer and closer to negative three. So in this case, the limit and the functional value are the same. Everyone okay with that? So what's the difference between these two statements? I write negative three for both of them, but what am I saying differently here? Well, so the first one is when evaluating this function at negative four, it spits out the answer negative three. Good, so uh, when, when we evaluate it at four, when we plug in the domain value four, it evaluates to the range value of negative three, okay? So the limit is when we evaluate around the input of four it, and approach arbitrarily close to for what is that output approach? Great. So I, I agree. I agree 100% with what Will just said. So limits are used to evaluate the behavior around a particular x value. Okay. So we're looking at whether how this function behaves near four, not at four, but near four, and specifically as we approach four. Okay. From either direction in this case. Okay. So go ahead and fill out the other two then. Got four more blanks. Go ahead and fill them out. Talk with your group. Okay, let's uh, bring your attention back up here. Who's got, a, who's got an answer for g of 4? Here's this function g. We're asking for g of 4. Who's got a, what they think is a solution to it? Jordan? Justin. Justin. I'm sorry, Justin. I'm sorry. It'll take a while. Uh, it's considered a hole on the actual graph, but the limit as it's approaching 4 from each side is going towards negative 3. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, I agree with that. So the limit here is going to be what? Negative 3. And what do we say for the functional value? Undefined. 
Okay. So if you put does not exist, I won't mark you wrong. Uh, but specific, when we talk about, if I say evaluate a function in a place and you can't, you usually say undefined. We'll use does not exist actually when we talk about when you can't find the limit. And that's kind of the way we'll keep, a, keep track of those two ideas. Yeah, so here, so uh, uh, as Justin said, there is a hole in the graph there. This is actually, uh, this example is very similar to the one on the previous page where we could not evaluate the function at four, but we could still describe how the function is behaving around four, okay? All right, who's got uh, h of four? Yeah, Freddie. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, h of four is gonna be five, and then the limit is gonna be uh, negative three. The limit's gonna be negative three. Folks, do you agree? Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, Sean. Can you annotate the, um, the hole in the graph at all? What's that? You have to annotate anywhere the, the hole. So, so, these two ideas put together, and this is, this is actually, uh, Sean brings up a really good point. Um, in some of the uh, homework problems, or I don't know if they're homework problems, I'm gonna have you guys work a couple of problems where I might give you these two pieces of information, and from these two pieces of information, I think that there's enough to see that there's a hole in the graph there. Near four, it's approaching negative three, but at four, we've got five, and so that's a hole in the graph uh, uh, with, it fill, with, with a point up here. Whereas this is also enough to tell me that there's a hole in the graph, right? Near four, we're approaching negative three, even though I can't plug four into the function. So both of these uh, two pieces of information are enough to tell us that, yeah, we, we do have a hole there. So you don't have to annotate it beyond that, but I think you're right, I think it's helpful to say, you know, if, if you're describing this, somebody say, hey, yeah, See, this is enough to say that there's a hole in the graph. Great, great. Other questions? Okay. So I've sort of summarized this here, but I, um, and I'll let you read through that, but my hope is that you see that evaluating a limit and evaluating the function at a point are not the same idea. And hopefully we're starting to see why we would want this limit notation. Because in both of these cases, there is a hole in the graph, but there's more going on. And the limit notation helps to clarify that. Great. OK. Uh, and, and number five is important. Uh, we will see in some cases both the limiting value and the functioning value maybe exist and maybe the same or different. So, for example, in the first one here, the functional value and the limit value, they both exist and they agreed with each other. Whereas in the third example, the functional value and the limiting value, they both existed, but they were different. Okay? Here, we have the limit uh, value existing, but the functional value not existing. And I, didn't, I could have put up a fourth possibility. And that's where the functional value exists, but the limit doesn't. We haven't seen an example yet where the limit doesn't exist, but we'll get there, okay? So there's lots of possibilities that we could have with these graphs. Okay, so here's a very interesting function, and we're gonna study this one quite a bit in this class. We're looking at the function, the sine of x divided by x. Okay? So first of all, I ask you the question, what is f of zero? Can't exist. It's, it's, it can't exist or is undefined. Yeah, why is that? What, why, why is it undefined? What do you say? Uh, um, hmm, once, who hasn't gone yet? Derek, what do you say? Why is this undefined? Is, is it Derek? Oh, Dalton. Dalton, Dalton, oh, I'm sorry. Folks, this is going to take me a while. <laughs> okay. okay, you got to, I, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. First letters good. I get first letters down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dalton, help me out. Because uh, it's divided by zero. Yeah, you cannot plug a zero into this function because you're not allowed to divide by zero. Okay. So this is undefined. Anyone have any questions about that? That was a great time to ask if you got me. Okay. Still, even though the function's undefined at zero, I'd like to explore the behavior near zero. So in this case, um, I've got a graph for you. We can see that as our x values are getting closer and closer to zero, so this would be this point right here, this point right here, this point right here, 
it appears that the y values are getting closer and closer to what? 1. Okay. So we could go ahead and say that the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of x divided by x is equal to 1. And I've shown you the same information here on the uh, table. We can see that as my y x values get closer and closer to 0 from either direction, the idea of either direction is important. You have to check both directions. We see that the range values are getting closer and closer to 1. Okay. Folks, again, I've only asked you to guess at the limit. I'm not asking you to tell me what the limit is because this method of looking at a graph or this method of plugging values into a table isn't good enough. Okay. And in fact, I think on the next page I'll show you a few examples as to where this fails. Yep. Okay. So let's take a look at the next page here. Uh, at this point, the guess method is the only method we have for determining limits. We're going to get to some other methods later today. Okay. But this method is not ideal and is not considered a justification for the limit value. Okay. So folks, on a test, if I ask you to find the limit of a particular function, you cannot just build me a table of values and plug tiny numbers in your calculator and say what the answer should be. Okay. There's a few ways that this can go wrong. The first way this could go wrong is if you choose an incorrect path towards the limit. Folks, here I've built a table of values for this particular limit here. Okay, as we plug in uh, values, they appear to be getting closer and closer to zero. And I could have actually done this from either direction. Okay, so I could have put you know, plus or minus one, plus or minus one third, plus or minus one fourth, one tenth, one, uh, what is that? one ten thousandth. Okay. It appears that the y values are all staying at what? Zero. It would be incorrect to say that this limit is zero just from looking at these values. Again, what I'm showing you is where this table method can go wrong. Okay. It turns out if you looked at the graph of this function, okay, the graph of this function looks something like this. Forgive me, I can't really draw it. The graph of this function looks something like this. And what's happening at zero? It is oscillating so rapidly that it never approaches some fixed number there. The closer it gets to zero, the more rapidly it oscillates. Now, it just so happened that the x values I picked um, were these values right here when it did cross the x-axis. But that was a coincidence. Now, if you were just randomly picking x values, you probably wouldn't pick the ones where that occurred. Okay? But again, I'm trying to show you ways in which this table method can fail. Okay? And in fact, we would say that the limit uh, as x approaches 0 of the sine of pi over x does not exist. Okay? And the reason, a kind of a rough justification that I can give you right now is it oscillates too rapidly. The closer you get to zero, the more rapidly it oscillates. Questions on that? Okay. Here's another way this, that this guess and test method go, go wrong. If you, not, if you don't approach close enough. If you look at this first table that I built here, what does it look like the limit is? Yeah, as the x values are getting closer and closer to 0, it looks to me like the y values are also getting closer and closer to 0. But this is misleading because I'm not zooming in far enough. If I were to take this table further, we in fact see that this limit comes out to be uh, what is that? 1 over 10,000. Who wants to summarize what I'm doing right now? Shot at summarizing it. Yeah, Mike. You're 
poking holes in the guessing method. Yeah, I'm showing ways in which this guessing method can go wrong. Okay? Right. Great. Okay, I've got one more for you. Uh, and that's using a machine to estimate values where a round off error can produce extraneous results or erroneous results. Okay, let me just show you an example of this. Um, And I found this interesting because I did this example uh, a few years ago, and uh, I saw the round-off error very quickly. Now I have to go further before I actually see the round-off error. So here I've taken, um, oh, let me give you the function. Uh, sorry about that. Let me put it on the, so you've got it here. Let's look at this function right here. Uh, f of x is equal to the square root of x squared plus 9 minus 3 all over x squared and we're looking at the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. I want to explore the behavior as my x values get closer and closer to 0 for this particular rational function, well it's not quite a rational function because of the square root, but for this particular fraction. See? So this is kind of interesting. In the last problem, what did we say the issue was? We, we looked at a table and we did what? We didn't zoom in far enough, right, to actually see what the answer is. You might just say, well, let's just, I mean, as long as you pick an incredibly <coughs> tiny number, you'll never be wrong. Okay? And here's the exact opposite situation. Okay? Here I'm plugging in x values that are getting closer and closer to 0, and it seems to me that the y values are getting closer and closer to looks like the fraction one-sixth, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's true. The answer to this is one-sixth. Okay, why don't I have my mouse? Uh, hmm. Second, whoops. And, the fra and, it, and it, it turns out, yes, the answer is one-sixth to this. But look what happens if I zoom in on this machine further and further. It starts behaving strangely. And that's because of a round-off error in this problem. And in fact, we could even take this and graph it. Let me put this in a, what's your, I don't know, what's your guys' favorite no. graphing tool? Yeah, I like Wolfram Alpha, that's the one I go to. A lot of students like Desmos, there's a lot of them. Let's look at the graph of this function near zero. Okay. There's the graph of this function near zero, right? And we can see, hey, it appears that the closer and closer we get to zero, the closer the y values get to about one-sixth. Okay? But if I make the mistake of zooming in too far, let's see how it behaves when I zoom in further. oscillation that's happening right here. Is that oscillation like the oscillation that we saw before? No. This oscillation is actually due to a round off error in the machine trying to calculate this limit, trying to calculate this expression right here. Okay. So in one example I said, hey, we didn't zoom in far enough. In another example we let a machine do the calculation and we zoomed in too far with the round off error. So this is one of the many reasons why this method can fail. Yeah? I was just going to ask, is that, when you say round off, is that a floating point error in the machine itself? I believe so, yeah. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the right person to talk about this. Uh, I just know some examples of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it has to do with um, uh, how many decimals it's taking the number to when it stores it. And for the two, so it calculates the numerator. I don't, I don't, I'm not certain, but I think it's calculating the numerator, calculating the denominator, and it's rounding both of those. And then eventually it looks like it's approaching, like we saw here. It makes it look like we're approaching zero 
when in fact the answer is one sixth. Okay. So hopefully I've, I've made you now skeptical of this um, guess and test method. Okay. All right. Um, let's get in some more uh, definitions. Okay. Um, sometimes when we're be working with a function, we may only want to explore the limit as we approach from one direction or another. So we're going to introduce the idea of left hand and right hand limits. Okay. So um, for a function f of x defined on this open interval from a to c, if as x approaches c, this is the key part, from the left, okay, and if the range values appear to be approaching some fixed y value, then we'll write the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x is equal to uh, l. Okay. So what's the key word here that makes this a different definition from before? We're approaching C from the left here. Okay. How do I designate that we're approaching F of C from the left in the notation? Do you see it? This, this minus sign right here. That's how I show that I'm approaching from the left. Okay. The picture that goes with this is that I'm only picking X values from the left, and those are what are approaching arbitrarily close to C. And what we would find is, so here would be the point first, here would be the point, uh, there would be the point, there would be the point. And we see that the y values are getting closer and closer to this y value of L as we approach C from the, from the left. Okay? We could do the exact same thing. I think you could probably come up with this definition. If we approach from the right, how do you think we're going to write this? Yeah, the limit as x approaches c from the, so to show that we're coming from the right, we're going to put a plus sign on that. And that's how we define this right-hand limit, and the key there is we're coming from the right-hand side. Okay? Folks, this is the direction of approach. It's not the side of the graph that we're talking about. Okay? So, I'm making a, I'm approaching from the right to make a statement about this segment over here that would be at the left end of the interval for which I'm approaching. That can be a little confusing. So just keep in mind that it's the direction of approach that we're specifying. Okay. So again, we're plugging in numbers that are getting closer and closer to C, and we see that the Y values in this case are getting closer and closer to L. So, uh, do I have any physics majors in here? Maybe? Anyone heard of the Heaviside function? It's a really important function in physics. Uh, sometimes people use it to model like what happens exactly at the moment that you throw a switch. Okay. Uh, or something like that. Anyway, here's a, here's a description. There's kind of multiple descriptions. Nobody's really agreed on it. But here's a description of the Heaviside function. Okay. So we've got that h of t is piecewise defined. Do you remember piecewise functions? means I give, it says, it says this rule has different parts. If you fall into this category, this is your rule. If you fall into this category, this is your rule. Or if you are at zero, this is your rule. Okay. If you're rusty with piecewise functions, you're going to want to come, we brush up on them a little bit, but also come by and see me in office hours to talk about it. Okay? Because we're doing a lot of piecewise functions in here. So, Let's go ahead and explore uh, this function. First of all, what is h of 0 in this case? h of 0 is 1 half. Okay, and that's just by the way it was defined. Okay. Well, the left-hand limit as x approaches 0 from the left, right? That's, uh, I, I've, it's kind of redundant. I wrote the word left-hand limit, and I showed the direction of approach here from the left. Well, what would the left-hand limit be? Well, let's go ahead and look at the graph of this function. Okay, I'm going to graph this piecewise function. So it says that um, prior to arriving to 0, all of our output values need to be 0. Okay. 
Okay? If I input, this says if I input a negative number into the function, it outputs a zero. Whereas if I input a positive number into this function, it spits out a one. If I input the number zero, it spits out a half. So here we see that the uh, limit as x approaches 0 from the left of the heavis, oops, I should not use x. No, oh, I, but I, it should say t here, right? Everyone see that? And that's just because I, I wasn't consistent between my domain value. Okay. So the limit as t approaches 0 from the left of h of t is what? It's 0. Everyone see that? Okay. As we plug in t values that are getting closer and closer to zero, but what's our direction of approach? We're coming from the left. What do the y values appear to be approaching? Well, they're always, the y values are always outputting zero, so the limit appears to be zero. Okay. Likewise, what's the limit as t approaches zero from the right of h of t? It's equal to 1. And again, we see that as we plug in <coughs> t values as they approach 0 from the right, the y values are approaching 1. So here's an example of a graph right away where just having the definition of a limit wasn't enough to explore what was happening with this function at 0. All right. So based on our definition of left-hand and right-hand limits, we can come up with another way of defining the definition, or giving a definition for the limit. Okay? So it says that if the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x equals the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of f of x equals some number l, then we say The limit, and I'm going to use this phrase, the limit proper, as to, to show that I'm distinguishing between left and right hand limits and the limit that we were talking about before. Then the limit as x approaches, um, let me see here, folks, I sort of made a mistake. Rather than saying zero, picking a, a particular value that we want to talk about, let's keep that abstract at a. The limit as x approaches a of f of x is also equal to l. Any questions so far? Kick people out for asking questions, so don't ask them. <laughs> no, no, please. Please ask questions. Okay. So something to be careful of is I can write this limit expression all day long, as much as I want. But just because I write a limit expression doesn't mean that that limit actually exists. So we've got to be a little careful with this. Okay. So uh, let's just reinterpret this definition. It says that the limit exists if and only if the left and right hand limits exist. And they are what? Equal or the same. Okay. So this is an, another way of defining the limit. Is we define left and right hand limits. If those two limits exist, that's an important part of it, and they agree with each other, then that is the limit, and I'll use the word proper sometimes, that's the limit proper of the function at that <coughs> domain value. Okay. All right, we're going to come back and work. Uh, Let's, let's actually, let's put this into practice a little bit. So let's go uh, jump back to page, um, my page number's been cut off. I'm not sure what page this is. Page six, yeah. Let's turn to page six. We'll come back and pick up some more information on page five here in a minute, but I just want to work a couple of examples here. Okay. Folks, these graphs are a little hard to read. I apologize, I copied them from an old textbook. Um, there's your axes, do you see it? So the grid lines are so thick, it's kind of hard to see where your axes are. OK, 
The first question says to evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. Okay. What is the limit of this function as x approaches 2 from the left? It's 3. Does everyone see that? So where's the number 2? It's down here. We're going to approach 2 from which direction? From the left. And as we do so, we see that the y values, we pick in, if we pick these here, the y values appear to be approaching 3. The second one says, let's find the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Okay, what does that limit appear to be? It appears to be 1. Okay. Here we see that as we approach 2 from the right, the y values appear to be approaching 1. Okay. Folks, slow down on these problems. I don't think that they're too terribly taxing, but you can't go quickly through them. Take your time to think about it. Notice that I've, for a lot of these, I've drawn the little arrow marks or something to help me think about it. I encourage you to do the same until you get really good at these. Okay. All right, letter C says, give the limit. Okay. Call it the limit proper. Undefined. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to go ahead and say that the limit does not exist. As opposed to saying it's undefined, although if you put that, I, I know exactly what you mean. Okay. We're going to go ahead and put that the limit does not exist. Why? Because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit, they disagree with each other. Okay. okay. The next question says, find f of 2. What is f of 2? Let's go ahead and pick another color here. f of 2 is equal to 3. Why is that? Because that's the point that's included on the graph for the corresponding domain value of 2. Okay. So remember when last time I put up three graphs, at one point I put up three graphs. We had the limit existed and the functional value existed and they were the same. Well, they both existed and they were different or the limit existed but the functional value didn't. Here's an example where the functional value exists but the limit does not exist. Okay. So you can see we do need this idea of limits to describe all of the possibilities for how these graphs can behave near a particular domain value. Okay. All right, what's the limit proper as x approaches 4 for this function? It is 4 even though f of 4 is undefined. Okay. Uh, I'll let you guys do number 14 on your own time. Okay, do work through it. Let me know if you have any questions. I think you've got all the tools you need to do that. Okay. Let's flip over to number 15 here. Okay. I want to highlight one part of this. I, I, again, I feel, well, actually, let's, let's do um, A, B, and C here for, and D here first. Okay. For some reason, and I completely understand why, Folks have a hard time doing left and right hand limits with the negative numbers. Just slow down. You, you've got everything you need, but slow down. Okay. So letter A here says to find the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left. Okay. So in this case, if you messed it up, you're going to get the right answer. Uh, but let's go ahead and show what we mean by that. We're approaching negative 3 from which way? from the left. Okay. And so what are our y values doing? They appear to be approaching the y value of, what is that? I think that's one, uh, let's see here. Four. One, two, three, four. I believe that's four. Okay. What about when we approach negative three from the right in B? Okay. Notice that we also get four but there was a difference in the way we approached the problem, literally. Questions on that? Okay. So there's two reasons why this is the answer. One is we could just say, hey, the behavior around negative 3 appears, 
if we look at the behavior of the graph around the x value negative 3, the y values seem to be getting closer and closer to 4. But we could also make the same argument. Why? Because the left hand limit and the right hand limit, they, agree, they both exist and they're equal. Okay? And then what is f of negative 3? Undefined. Undefined. So there's one other one that I want to talk about here because this is the only instance where we, uh, there's not a lot of examples that I can come up with where this happens that I've thought of. Okay, and this is a great one for this. If we look at the limit as x approaches 5 from the right, we're going to plug in values approaching 5 from the right, and it seems to me that the y values appear to be approaching 3. Do you agree? What about if we approach 5 from the left? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and say that it does not exist, as Freddie says. Okay? And we see that, and it's kind of hard to see on this picture here, but it's oscillating so rapidly, the closer it gets to negative 5, or sorry, 5 from the left, the more rapidly it oscillates. And so that limit does not exist. There are, there's, other, there's plenty of other examples where limits do not exist, or left or right hand limits do not exist, but they're difficult to draw, usually. Okay. All right, questions on this? Okay. Let's go. Um, <laughs> So I'd like everyone to turn, uh, this is now I think page 7, I'd like you to try 18A in your groups. Okay, go ahead and work together on this, see if you can do 18A. And you will have a test question like this.
Okay, folks, I want to draw your attention up here. I know a lot of you aren't done. I just want to talk about how, to, how I would tackle this problem because I think this is a typical problem to see sometimes on exams. Okay. First of all, there's no one right answer, uh, but you have to have everything that's listed up here correct. Does that make sense? So you and I might have a different graph, but we need to agree in these fundamental areas that I've listed. Okay. I would recommend you get starting with plotting points. You do know a few points on here. Which points do you know? We know that 0, negative 1 is a point on this function, right? So we know we've got this point right here on the function. What else do we know? 3, 1. We know that the ordered pair 3, 1 is on this function. Okay. So that's maybe a good place to get started. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and start tackling uh, the limit information that we were given. Okay. And by the way, sometimes the best way to do these problems is just take a guess and adjust. Write something down, figure out where you're wrong, and try to fix it. Okay. So here we say the limit as x approaches 0 of this function is 1. That means that as the x values get closer and closer to 0, the y values have to be getting closer and closer to 1. Now, can I actually fill in a dot there? No. No, because this is a function, and we've already plotted the corresponding y value to that function at 0. So we'll go ahead and put a hole there, and I don't know, I'll just draw something like that. Just check. Is it true that as we plug in x values getting closer and closer to 0, the y values are getting closer and closer to 1? Mm -hmm. okay. And there's no reason to be horizontal. I did that. Maybe I shouldn't. That might be misleading. Okay. There's no reason why you have to be horizontal uh, as you do that. I could have done something like that. I don't know. Okay. All right. The other limits say, as we approach 3 from the left, the y values have to be approaching negative 2. So let's approach. So first of all, we're not going to have a point there at, negative, at, at 3, negative 2. But as we approach 3 from the left, the y values have to be approaching negative 2. Now again, I chose to go up and then down. Everything on here, I've met all the stipulations. I've still got a little more to the graph to draw, but I haven't violated any of the statements that I've made. If you just went straight down, you're okay, right? The point is, I mean, we're not going to have the same graph at the end of this, but we are going to behave the same way near all of the points of interest. Okay? Similarly, uh, we say that as we approach 3 from the right, the y values are approaching 2. And I don't know, maybe this is our graph here. I don't, you know. Good enough. Okay. So please don't copy your graph to look exactly like mine, but do make sure that in each one of these areas, you are behaving the same way as me. These parts you have to agree with. You've got a couple more on here. Uh, let's see. I've given two others. Okay. Oops. One of those will show up on an attendance quiz next time. Okay. Or something very close to those. Any questions, folks? Yeah, since Sean. There's, since there's five parts, you just mainly want to, like on a test, would you want us to like highlight, hey, here are my five points? You just said, I mean, I'll do, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to clarify to me what you've done, but your graph should reflect it. So I've circled here in green the things that I think you need to, well, that you need to have. You don't have to do something like that. In fact, I wouldn't just because it kind of clutters stuff up. Uh, but I'm just doing that to emphasize it for you. Yeah. So you just have to, you just have to satisfy the directions of drawing a graph that, that meets all of these conditions. You can make... For the parts that I don't specify, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you wish. But, it, but, we, but we would all agree with these parts right here. Great question. Other questions? Okay. Um, let's see. Is there anything else? I don't think so. Let's, uh, let's go back here. I want to pick up some of this information. Folks, uh, beyond page 
beyond this page, everything else is just examples, so I'm not worried if we don't cover all those examples, but I do want to get a little bit more of this information out here. Okay. Um, I'm actually jumping ahead of the book at the moment. The book gives a whole section for this later on, but I just want to go ahead and get some of this notation and terminology out of the way now, give you a little more time to get exposed to it. Let's look at the graph of f of x equals 1 over x squared. Okay. The graph of this function looks something like this. Let's just talk about how I know what little I knew about this graph. Okay. First of all, if I plug in 1, it spits out a 1, because 1 squared is 1, and 1 divided by 1 gives me 1. Right? So does everyone agree that these are two points on the graph? 1, 1, and minus 1, 1? Okay. What happens when I divide the number 1 by a large number? It gets smaller, right? Like if I put in a 10 for x here, it'd be 1 100th. That's a very small, but what's the sign on that number? Positive, right? 1 1 1 100th 1, 1 is a small but positive number. Okay? So as I plug in large numbers for x, or negative in large numbers for x because of the squared, my y values will be approaching 0. Okay, in fact, using that word approaching hints at something we'll be saying later about these limits. Right? But they're always positive. What happens if I divide the number 1 by a small number? Like if I looked at f of 0 0.02. Okay, well, that would be 1 divided by 0 0.02 squared, right? Which would be, uh oh, 1 divided by 0 0.00. 0, 4, I believe. Count my decimal places, make sure I did that right. Okay. What's, what is 1 divided by 0, 0.004? That's a very, very large number. Right? So it seems to me that as the x values, as the x values approach 0 from either direction here, because of the symmetry in this graph, the f of x values do what? They get large, right? They're not a pro the, the limit, first of all, does everyone agree that the limit doesn't exist here as we approach zero? As we plug in numbers getting close to zero, are we approaching some fixed number, like 10 or 7? No. The closer we get to zero, the bigger we get, okay? So if this happens, we're going to go ahead and say the limit as x approaches that particular domain value, if they're becoming arbitrarily large and positive, we'll put infinity there. Okay. This is the first time we've sort of, I'm not claiming to do anything crazy here, this is the first time you've sort of had the number, the, not the, I shouldn't say the number, the concept in infinity defined in a math class. Okay. Hopefully somebody at some point has told you infinity is not a number on the number line. It's a concept. It's a concept that describes what's happening right here. It describes this arbitrarily largeness. Okay? So in fact, that's the blank, arbitrarily large. Okay. If the values become arbitrarily large and negative, so I'll, I want to emphasize that they're large, so I'll often say large negative. Do you, you know what I mean by when I say that? I mean in the absolute value sense they're getting large. So I'm talking about like negative 1,000, negative 10 million, et cetera. Okay? So I'll say large negative. Okay? Then what do you think we'll write? We'll say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals what? Negative infinity. Okay? And we can apply that to left and right hand limits as well. So what happens here? Well, you saw this graph in college algebra, right? We saw this graph in college algebra. Usually we put a little dashed line here. What did that dashed line represent? An asymptote. What type of asymptote? Vertical. 
vertical asymptote. In this class, it's, I mean, I know everyone knows their different, the difference between vertical and horizontal lines, okay, but in this class, it's fundamental that you, under, that you say it's a vertical asymptote as opposed to a horizontal asymptote, because those are caused by different things. Okay, different, different characteristics cause different, the two different asymptotes. Okay? So this gives us a vertical asymptote. So if the limit proper or the left-hand limit or the right-hand limit ever comes out to be either infinity or minus infinity, okay, if any one of those three types of limits we've discussed comes out to be arbitrarily large, positive, or arbitrarily large, negative, then we say that F has a vertical asymptote at that location. Okay, let me roughly, quickly uh, sketch the graph of this function, f of x, right here. Okay. So the graph of this function looks something like this. Okay, you could graph it in a graphing utility, or you could sketch it using your techniques from college algebra on your own. Okay. The graph of this function looks something like this. So let's say a few things. What's the limit as x approaches uh, 3 from the right of this function? It's infinity. OK? Do we all agree with that? Some puzzled looks. We OK with that? Yeah? As, as the x values get closer and closer to 3, but coming from the right, the y values are becoming arbitrarily large. Okay. If we look at the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, we'd say it's negative infinity. Okay. By the way, what's the limit proper? Yeah, it does not exist because the left and right hand limit don't agree with each other. Now, this part is a little bit frustrating, folks. In all three of these cases, none of the limits exist. Okay, I want to make sure this makes sense because this is a very subtle point. Okay. The right-hand limit does not exist, right? Because we are not approaching some fixed number. So the right-hand limit does not exist. But I can further clarify the behavior by putting that positive infinity there. Okay. So in some cases, the answer will be the limit doesn't exist, but we put infinity. We put an answer there because it's describing the behavior, even though the, lim the function is not approaching some fixed number there. Okay. But we, can't, we still can't further clarify what's happening at the limit proper. So we just put does not exist. There's no other way we can describe that behavior. Okay. Um, if I were to look at the graph of this function, the graph of this function at negative 3 looks something like this. It actually looks quite a bit like our x squared function. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, folks, I'm sorry. I changed this on you. Um, I don't know if it was updated in what I printed out for you, but um, <coughs> this should be. I apologize, this should be just 2x over x minus 3 quantity squared. Anyway, what we see here, if this is the graph of that, so this is, this is still the graph of that, the limit as x approaches uh, 3 from the right of f of x is still infinity. The limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x is now what? It's also infinity. And then the limit proper then is what? Infinity. We would say that it's infinity. Now, am I claiming that the limit exists? No. No, it's still just becoming arbitrarily large, but I can further clarify by saying that it's infinity. Okay, so the limit doesn't exist, but we say that it's infinity to describe the behavior. Okay, so in both of these cases, we have shown that there is a vertical asymptote 
at x equals 3 for both of these functions. Why? Well, look at our definition of a vertical asymptote. If any one of those three limits comes out to be infinity, we say that there's a vertical asymptote there. Will? Was that just because of the denominators of those fractions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were, so we'll talk about this in more detail later, but we were exploring the behavior of the function in a place where it wasn't defined. And oftentimes those, uh, the behavior near a place where the function un is undefined leads to a vertical asymptote. Although the other option is it could lead to a hole. It was the two outcomes for, for, uh, for real value functions. Great. Folks, I need you to know the graph of your natural log of x. Okay, somebody should be able to shake you awake from the deepest depths of slumber and say, quickly, draw the graph of the natural log of x, and you should be able to do it without thinking. Okay? So if, you're, if you've forgotten it, that's okay. Put it on a flashcard, put down its domain, put down its range, draw its graph, but you do need to have this down because I'm going to call upon your understanding of this all the time in this class. Okay? And yeah, I know you can enter in some of the numbers into a calculator, but that still doesn't help you. Okay? So what does the graph of the natural log of x look like? Yeah, so the domain goes from 0 to infinity, not including 0. Good. There's one nice point on it. What is it? <laughs> well, that's not very nice. <laughs> we could put that on there. What's the natural log of 1? Zero. Natural log of 1 is 0. Okay. So the graph of the natural log curve looks something like this. Okay. So let's look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of this function. What does it come out to be? Negative infinity. Okay. What's the limit as x approaches 0 from the right? Oh, sorry, from the left. Does not exist. Okay, who said that? Yeah. Freddie says does not exist. Why not? So the function is undefined for values to the left of uh, 0 and 0 itself, So it's a, but, but specifically in this case to the left of 0. So we can't explore how the function is behaving to the left of 0. So the limit, to, the limit from the left-hand side does not exist. Okay. What does that tell us about the limit proper? Does not exist. The limit as x approaches 0 proper of h of x does not exist. Okay. But still, because one of these three came out to be either infinity or minus infinity, that's enough to say that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Okay. 